If you'll stand with me real quick just to read a passage of Scripture, Colossians, third chapter, Colossians 3, starting verse 15 through 17. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs of gratitude in your heart to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Father, we thank You for Your Word. I pray that You will just anoint my words, Lord, because Your Word is already anointed. And I pray it will accomplish everything that you desire to accomplish today. In the name of Jesus, amen. I mean, if you had a little, uh, what we call dis-ease this week or a little unrest this week, most everybody does. We go through cycles where you'll have great weeks, which is just, I mean, it's just right on top of everything. Everything's smooth. Everything moves through your life pretty well. You realize right now we're into the fifth month of this year of 2013. It has been such a hectic and a hurried pace that by the time we get to the fifth month, most of us are thinking, wow. Whew. And you get to that point and you have so much that happens in your life that it's so busy that life does go so fast. If you had some little dis- dis-ease or unrest this week, I want to share with you a little bit today about the peace of God. Because I really believe God desires for each one of us to have His peace that passes all understanding. To have that peace that sometimes you can't even figure out where it's coming from, but it is there. I do believe that if you think about it geographically, what is the greatest place of peace for you? Some of you would say the ocean. But just sitting by it, nothing to do. You can seem to wash away everything that you can imagine if you're sitting by the ocean. Some people would be sitting out in the middle of a lake Waiting on some fish to bite some hook. I have no peace in that whatsoever. Uh, put me on the end of a ski rope in the middle of a lake, I may be a little peace there, but not on waiting on some fish to bite a hook. Then you have others that would think up in the mountains, you could go there. Then you could find that perfect peace, that ideal spot that by that river that's flowing, so babbling down the riverside, by the, down the mountainside. I love those places. What if I tell you that you can have peace right where you are, right in the middle of your dis-ease, right in the middle of your unrest, you can have a peace that's far greater than any geographic peace that you can find. It takes me a while. I'll go up to Oak Mountain. There are times I'll tell folks I'm going up to Oak Mountain. I'll go sit on this rock that overlooks the Pelham area, and I'll just sit up there. It takes me a good hour before I find peace. That place doesn't just necessarily find. It doesn't presume. I don't presume upon it peace. I go up there looking for peace. And I have to end up praying through and finding peace. It takes about an hour any time I go up there and you find the peace of passes understanding. But the peace doesn't stay there necessarily. It is within. And one of the things I want to share with you today is in this passage of Scripture that Paul's writing to the church in Colossians here, he's telling them, he's saying, look, you guys, the peace of God, the peace of Christ can rule. That means umpire in your heart. That means make call the shots in your heart. And it doesn't have anything to do with what's going on externally. Every one of us has a life that's hectic. And anytime you ask somebody, if you've had a good week and life is grand, people will tell you that. If you've had a hectic week, most people will say, boy, it has been a hectic week. And usually you can read it all over somebody when they come in on a Sunday morning if they've had a hectic week. Our job is to preserve the peace within, to find that peace within. Not necessarily, I wish that every time something breaks out hectic, we could run to the beach, run to the mountains, run to the riverside, run somewhere. I love finding those places of peace and those little places, those pocket of peace. But even when you get there, if you're like me, you can't necessarily find the peace in that place. Peace has to be found somewhere else. What I've found is that when it tells us here, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let it umpire in your hearts. That comes in the first place it comes from as being positionally correct. And say, how is that? Positionally correct means that you're in the right place with God. If you really want peace, and what I have found that sin can bring dis-ease into my life, unrest into my life, any kind of sin, that sin of, of, of just being complacent, 
There's a sin and complacency in my Bible readings, in my prayer time. That complacency and my diligence of just seeking after God. That kind of sin of, of complacency of, of just saying, God, you know, life's going to come at you and you're just trying to take it where it goes. That is a sin. And with sin, what happens is, is dis-ease and unrest will come in every time. We want Christ to rule in our hearts. We want that. It comes from that first place, and that is positional. If you look back there in Colossians, the third chapter, you'll find that that's what he starts talking about here in the first verse. It says, since you have been raised with Christ. That's a positional place. If you ever want to understand where peace is going to come from, it comes from being in that right position with God. And that is that righteous place with God. And it also says that in Romans, the fifth chapter, it says that we have entered into this. Am I too loud? It seems loud up here. Is it loud? Is it okay? All right, that's fine. It just seems like I'm yelling at you. I don't mean to be, but I am. Romans, the fifth chapter, says, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God. That's another position place. That's a place that when you can find that position, it has nothing to do with... It. Sometimes you can find that position when you're there at the beach. You can find it when you're at the, the mountains or by a lake or something. You can find that positional place, but it's got to be found every day in our life to know that you're positionally righteously okay with God. When it says in Romans 14, 17 that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy. Those are the elements of the kingdom of God. Being in right standing with God provides the peace, and that peace will produce joy. Those are things that I have found to be true in my life. I've found to be true in Christians' lives. That positionally we have to find, and this is what he talks about here in the first part of this, in the first four verses there of, of Colossians, the third chapter. I'm going to read these to you because I want you to see the positional place that you need to be. First, it's in that setting your city, seated with Christ, set your hearts on things above. When you're in that positional place with God, that right position with God, that righteous place with God, then you have those things in your life that are set on things above. You can desire after, and most people say, I would be happy if, or I would have peace if. And we always put those caveats on everything. Boy, I would really have peace if everybody would just leave me alone this week. If I could just go on vacation. Well, I'll tell you something, folks. If you don't got peace before you go on vacation, I have found it takes me two or three days to unwind. And then by your third day into your vacation, you're going, Rrr. You're just barely growling instead of really growling. And you find that that positional peace with God has to be there because you're seated in Him. You, your understanding is it's found in Christ. That all the unrest and dis-ease that's going on all around you, when you walk out of here today, I don't care, you know, you listen to T as she's playing this, or listen to the band as they're playing, you can find some of the greatest peace in the world just sitting here. And then, then here comes the dread part. i got to walk out of these doors. And go back to whatever it was I was in. But you can keep the peace of God. It can rule. It can referee your heart. He goes on to say this. He says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Most people, if they want peace, what they end up doing, if they, they've got a disruption in their life, they try to buy something, move somewhere, do something. They change geographically. They change financially. Do something to try to find some peace. Like I said in the first service, you can buy that brand new car off the showroom floor that has the fresh leather smell. It doesn't have a stain on the carpet. And two months later, your grandkids or kids have ruined every bit of that. So your peace is gone. You can buy that brand new house sitting up on the hillside. That's the perfect place. It provides an ideal situation. But then you find your peace is not found in that either. It can provide an atmosphere for that, but the peace is found within. That's positionally. That's a place that we have to have. I do believe, as you look in the Scriptures, you'll see that I have found in my life that I have to keep my things, my eyes, my heart, my life set upon Christ. Everything around me looks to steal my peace. Everything. You got up this morning. You think about how many things interrupted the peace of God in your life. You just think about it. I mean, it can be as, as simple as, we're late, get in the car, you know, and everybody's screaming, everybody's mad, and everybody's upset. Or it can be something as simple as just, you know, you can get that phone call from somebody and it interrupts your peace. I've known people, to be honest, they'll get their peace so interrupted they can't even go to church. I'm not talking to you because obviously you didn't. But they won't even go to church because their peace has gotten so interrupted. I'm like, you know where I find peace is with God. Where I find God is gathered with His people. Even though there are some irritating people in the kingdom of God. You don't have to amen that one too loud. They're not here. They're down the street, the other churches. You know what I mean? 
We're all a loving, happy family, right? But I have found that when Jesus was speaking to his disciples in John, the 14th chapter, as Hugh touched a little bit on that, he was talking about going away. They're freaking out. And in that freak out moment, he gives them this. He says, peace I leave with you. Peace I give you. I do not give you peace as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Why is he telling them this? Because their life is about to be up. Up an upheaval in their life. They're about to find that Christ is missing, the one they followed for three years. They're about to find that he is going to be nailed to the cross, that he's going to be pers- they're going to be persecuted, and they're going to turn around, and he's not going to be there for a couple of days anyway, three days. And they're going to find that their whole life is in an upheaval. Folks, I want to tell you something. If I were to tell you a week from now that every one of your lives are going to be in an upheaval, that would freak you out, wouldn't it? If I were to tell you a week from now, two weeks from now, Let me give you three months from now. Your life is not going to be like it was. Everything is going to be upside down. You're going to lose everything that you got. You won't have anything to depend on, and nobody you know around is familiar. Wow. Now, put that in the context. Peace I leave with you. You're about to lose everything you know. is in what you've been familiar with for three years, disciples. You're about to lose it. What if I were to tell you that? I'll tell you something, folks. I do believe this. I do believe there's some storms on the horizon. Not the ones we're seeing today in the heavenlies. But I do believe there are some storms on the horizon. We have got to shore up where our peace is found. The reason I'm preaching this today is not because you're going to have storms next week. It's not because I know something that prophetically would sit there and go, okay, you're about to lose this, about to do that. But no, I, I, don't, I don't operate that way. But I can tell you this, what I can see on the horizon for this country, I can see on this horizon for us as a church is... I mean, when you got the Department of Defense trying to figure out how to stop evangelism, they have the guns, you realize. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't think there's a threat for that right now, but I do think if they're debating on how to stop evangelism, Christians from evangelizing, and the Department of Defense have all the guns, that's kind of scary in a certain sense. That's why Jesus says, my peace I live with you. It's not the peace of the world. It's not what you're looking at and you're going, okay, here's... Here's what we're going to see in this, this day and time. I do believe that Jesus, when he's speaking to his disciples, he tells them this. But he also tells them that again in John the 16th chapter, one of my favorite passages. I've been preaching this at several of the funerals I've preached because I love it. He says, I've told you these things, and he gives them this long litany of what's going to happen, and he gives them some heads up, and he says this. He says, you believe at last, but at time is coming and has come when, and will come. You will be scattered, each one to his own home. You all leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone, for my Father is with me. He's telling us, look, i got a peace. It doesn't have anything to do with the external things you're looking at. Positionally, I am with my Father, so I've got peace. He said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. That is the only place. Positionally in Christ, you'll ever find peace. It will not be found by what you do, what you do, where you go, what you wear, those kind of things. I do believe it's only found in that place in positionally in Christ. Now, when you do not have peace, the first place you need to go is check your position in Christ. You say, can I ever lose that? No, but you can be shaken from that place by circumstances and situations. You can forget that you're in that place. I don't know how many times I've done that, but I have. I, I forget whose I am. When I get shaken by external situations and circumstances that happen. But, but Jesus tells them this. He says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In other words, I've already won. You're in a position in me, so take heart. Folks, the worst thing that can happen to any one of us is the best thing that can happen to you. If you're a believer, you can die. You could die. Worst thing that could happen to you is the best thing that could happen to you as a believer. Every fear that you have that tries to steal your peace is tied back to the tentacles of death, some kind of separation. Every fear that you face, every kind of disruption of your peace is all tied back somehow to death. Positionally, once you believe in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Positionally, you're found in Him. Let His peace rule in your life. Put, what helps me is I put, try to put everything in perspective. Is this thing going to kill me? Whatever it is that tries to steal you, is it going to kill me? It may embarrass you. You may make mistakes and embarrass yourself and those kind of things. Is it going to kill me? No. Well, even if it does, so what? 
And that's a hard one to get to. And I'm not saying I'm there already. I'm just saying that that's a hard one to get to. But so what? If I die, it's like Paul said, to die is gain. Positionally in Christ, we're in a good place. The second thing he tells us here, and he starts looking at this, and let me give you this. Peace is a gift internalized to make the external less consuming. Peace is an internalized gift to make the external less consuming. If you let the external part of your life consume your peace, you're not concentrating on where you should be concentrating. That isn't that position in Christ. If the externals of your life, like last night I went to buy milk for the boys, Milk truck, that's what I need. I need it to be stored outside. The lady in front of me, her credit card couldn't work, and she was freaking out. Because, I mean, it was me and two other empty lines, but I'd already put my stuff on the conveyor belt. You know what I mean? And I got my stuff there. I don't want to move it. It's going to take, by the time I get the stuff moved over there, the card works. She tries two or three times. And the lady tries it behind the counter. And she's like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was like, I'm good. I got nowhere to be. Just got to get the milk home. That's all, before the ice cream melts. I said, no big deal, it's okay. That night I was okay. Other times you're going, I can't believe it, you know. Here, take my card, do something, you know. I do believe that there are times that our peace can be assaulted because we forget whose we are. We forget our position. We forget what it's all about. The second thing I see here in the scripture is that God tells us this. He says, there is a peace is not only positional, but it's purposeful. There's a purposeful fact that God gives us, and you'll see it there in Colossians. And to be purposeful in our peace means that we see that we put together all the things that can steal our peace. In Colossians, the fifth chapter, you'll find that it says, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. That's one of the hardest things. You've got to be purposeful in that. If you want peace in your life, you've got to be purposely putting to death those things that steal that peace. The purposeful part is you see that you see the, the sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire. All that is is allowing sin and God never coexist well together. If we allow sin into our lives, you cannot have peace. If you let me put it this way, allow. If you invite sin into your life. A lot of times we think of ourselves as victims of sin when we've invited it. I don't know how many people I've talked to, they go, oh, that's just, I've got this situation. I'm like, look, think back. You invited this in and now you're a victim. No, you're not a victim if you opened the door and whistled for the robber to come in. You're not a victim if you set yourself up for failure. You're not a victim of sin. You invited it in. That's why Paul's saying not only is it that positional, but it's purposeful in finding peace. You've got to be in that place. If there's anyone lacking peace here today, you know the first place I go is I look for where I've invited sin. And I ask sin to coexist into my life. And if I've invited sin in, then I've got to be purposeful to rid myself of those things. In other words, you repent. You set things in order. That's why he tells them this. He says, because of the wrath of God. You know, you lose peace if sin is in your life because sin always invites the wrath of God and the fear thereof, therein. Sin will always do that. Anytime someone is sin, have you ever talked to somebody that's been just, I mean, gross sin? The first thing, if they've got any kind of inkling of God whatsoever, they're going, man, he's going to strike me dead. I don't mean guys I worked around that they would let a cuss word fly and they're looking for lightning. And I'm going, no, man, God's going to bless you. It's okay. He's going to get you. He's, wanting, he's got your mercy. If you don't repent, then you better watch for the lightning to fly. If you don't find Jesus, and I would talk to him about that all the time. I'd tell him, I'd say, look, you got to find Jesus because the very, they had a fear about them. They had a fear that God was going to strike them down when they were doing wrong. And that was kind of like a little joke, but yet that's still the inkling of our own lives even as christians how many of us want to do five things right because we did one thing wrong because we're trying to avoid the wrath of god well being in peace of god means that you're positional but also means you're purposeful it's a purposeful position it's a, it's that place where we find that purpose of god we get rid of purposely get rid of these things and that's what he's telling them here it says because of these things the wrath of god is coming you used to walk in these ways in your life you once lived. But you, now you must rid yourselves of these things. And listen to what he tells us to rid ourselves of. Anger, rage, malice, slander, 
filthy language from your lips. These things will not coexist with a righteous position with God. If they try, peace will never be. Those don't mix. It's like the person that puts salt instead of sugar into your cake. There's nothing worse to find out that somebody has ruined your pound cake. Read the instructions. Look on the packaging. You can't have these things, and it goes on, it says, Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self and its practices, and you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and image of the Creator. I do believe that each, each one, if you want peace, first it's in that position, second it's in that purposely getting rid of those things that you know do not belong. They cannot coexist. It is not the ingredients for a healthy life. Then he gives us the powerful part. And he gives us this part in verse, in verse 12. He says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive whatever grievance you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now here's the powerful part, because I believe not only is it in that position, not only is it in that purposely getting rid of the stuff, but it is in that power of putting on Christ. When you got up this morning, did you clothe yourself in this compassion? The only way you find that out is when you find somebody's nagging at you. You'll find if you got compassion or if you're binding all these things or kindness. Was anybody unkind to you today? And did you return that unkindness? Well, did you forget that you're in a position in Christ? You can't invite anger and rage into your life and still keep peace. Those things do not work. They don't. And then you find in this, if you really want the powerful life, it's not only just getting rid of, not being in that position with Christ, being in that place with Him where you know you're living in that righteous place, then you're getting rid of all those things that you know do not belong. God is faithful to convict us of things that are in our life that do not belong. Then we not only live in that purposeful place, but we live in that powerful place where we start putting on those things that provide peace. How many times have you been kind to somebody and you had a, I mean, just a, I mean, it's like a warm, ooey-gooey feeling that comes over. That's the peace of God. You have somebody when they, you've loved them when they didn't need to be loved, when they didn't deserve to be loved. Have you ever sensed the peace of God that comes over you at that point? Have you ever had those times where, I mean, you clothed yourself in patience and you knew it, it was a God-given gift that you were given that? And as you were given that, here's the thing I want you to understand. That's where the peace permeates in your life. Because God, and, it, and I use this word, He ruled and reft in your heart. In other words, when you had a chance, you purposely chose not to be angry, and you chose patience. And by choosing patience, God graces you with His peace. You walk out of there and you, you walk out of the situation because it has nothing to do with sitting on a lake. It has nothing to do with sitting by the ocean, even though they can provide some peace. It has everything to do whether you're walking in obedience to God in that position He's provided for you as a saved, born-again child of God. And you're putting on Christ every day. You're ridding yourself. and You're going to have every opportunity even when you leave here. Then he goes on and he tells us this. Not only is it it's, it's one of those positional, not only is it purposefully getting rid of the other stuff, then you actually, you actually have a powerful experience with God where you're putting on Christ every day. And the last one is that of praiseworthy and just giving Him praise. What I have found in, in this part and what I see in here, it says, Let the peace of Christ rule as members of your heart, since members of one body you are called, and be thankful. You know, one of the greatest indicators in whether you got peace or not is the thanksgiving that comes out of your mouth. You realize that? Those two go together. If there is no praise and thanksgiving coming out of your mouth, you will not have peace. And say, wow, that means you're giving an offering of God, according to Hebrews 13th chapter. You're offering a praise and thanksgiving, an offering off your lips. And what is that? That just means in your life, if I am positionally right with God, 
then praise is going to flow out of my mouth. You're going to find that not only is I'm, am, I, am I repenting of my sins, getting rid of those things, and I'm putting on those right things, I'm finding that praise is flowing from my life. Because it goes on to say this, that when all these things are happening, the Word of God is dwelling richly in you. And this is where I, I find that, and I use this, because when the Word of God is dwelling richly in you, it says, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. I love that part because what comes out is the praiseworthy part of why your life is changing. This is the slosh ability that we should have in our life. If God is your peace, if He is providing the change in your life, you ought to be sloshing out everywhere you go. When we come here and you get a lesson on Sunday school, or you get a, a teaching, you get a, just a nugget. I don't believe everybody walks out of here at this full three or four point sermon. You'll get a nugget. And you'll take that with you. That can bring life to you. And as that brings life to you, you ought to be sloshing over everybody else. You ought to be saying, look, this is what God has done in my life. There ought to be a slosh ability. And that's where it says that when the Word of God is richly dwelling in you, I see it as an overflowing bucket that's going out to everyone else. If you're not speaking the Word of God, what you're learning to someone else, your slosh ability factor is not as good as it needs to be. You ought to be sloshing out everywhere you go. When you go to the restaurant this afternoon, you ought to go out and you ought to be speaking God's praises. You ought to be giving thanks. It says that it, even right before that, let's be thankful. Why should we be thankful? Because we've got a peace that is ruling in our hearts that is only provided by the power of the Holy Spirit that is transforming how we see this life. The world doesn't have this peace. The world is looking for this peace. They're trying to buy the newest and the brightest and the best thing. They're trying to go about life and get the newest and best relationship. They trade in the old for the new. They try to do anything they can to find this peace. You've got it. Because why? Because of Jesus Christ. And that's why it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. And the last thing he tells us to do is not only is it that praiseworthy, giving him praise and all this, but the last thing he tells us to do is do everything we can in the name of the Lord, whether it's in word or in deed. If I keep that in mind, folks, I keep my peace. If somebody crosses me, or when I cross somebody, if I've got everything in my mind, I'm doing it because I want to honor Him. The Bible puts it this way, and I've, I've shared that with you early in Romans 14, 17. It says, anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God. In other words, it says, not a matter of eating, drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Folks, here's where the rubber meets the road. You want the peace of God? Everything that you do, whether in word or deed, do it as if you're doing unto the Lord. Sometimes it'll make you bite your tongue, won't it? Huh. Shouldn't say that. Or next time that you get to griping and complaining because you're serving and nobody else around you is. We've all done it. Whether it's in your home, whether it's in church, whether it's at work. I'm picking up this trash and nobody else is. Rawr, 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 rawr. Whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it unto the Lord. You know what? So you pick that piece of garbage, you're walking down through there and nobody, I mean five people have walked past it and you blend down and you pick it up. Doggone. At least I stopped the sixth one from walking over it. No, you pick it up and say, God, ain't nobody looking. It's to your glory. You think that's dumb. That's simple. Yeah, it is. Everything we do, whether word or deed, we do it unto him. Everything. That's a good way to figure out, hey, how am I living my life? Am I living it for myself? What comes out of my mouth? Is it praiseworthy? Am I living that place with Him where it's positionally, purposefully, getting rid of the old, powerfully living in His new presence? If we're a new creation, folks. The world out here is waiting. Let's slosh all over them. Let the Word of God dwell in you richly. Let's pray together. Would you stand with me, please? I want to close this out in prayer. Father, today is we prayed even at communion time there are folks that need a peace that passes understanding it has nothing to do with what's going on around us it has everything to do with what's going on in us 
So, Father, I pray for this church. I pray for this body. I ask you that we have the Word of God dwelling in us richly, richly, so that we're sloshing all over people. Father, if we don't have the Word of God sloshing, then we're sloshing our stuff all over them, our anger, our rage, our malice, because we're not ridding ourselves of those things. Father, remind us of our position in you. Know it was you who purposely helped us escape the wrath of sin. That wrath was prepared for sin, to destroy sin, not for us. And I thank you for that. And Lord, you give us the power to put on this new self, this whole new self in Christ. And we give you praise for that. But Lord, if our praise indicator in our life, if it is not even being used right now, if we're not praising you, for the newness of life every day, then our peace is not intact. And so I ask you, Lord, for that peace. Help us to be able to put that peace first and foremost. Let your peace rule in our lives. Let it referee our hearts. Change us, Lord, into your image. Thank you for that, Father. We bless you, Lord, for this day. May we slosh out of those around us in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have an awesome day. I'm going to release you at this time.